Jared, is dia Ismeret, is Misha Aaron Edwards. Hello, good day. That's Gaelic for welcome and hello. Uh, my name is Aaron Edwards and my pronouns are they and them. Uh, this is episode 37 of Inspiring Insights. So welcoming you all into this space. I am so, so happy to be joining all of you fantastic, lovely folks here on this live recording of Inspiring Insights with Theodore Kostasis, who I'm going to introduce in just one second. Uh, first, a little bit about me. I'm an uprooted Newfoundlander. Uh, I have Irish and Welsh descendants. I'm the offspring of two teachers, and I take that quite literally. I feel like I have a lot to learn and very much to step into in my own teachings. And um, and now I teach mindfulness. I offer soul-centered human transformation. And physically, I'm taking up space here in Takaranto, a land that is and was tended by many nations, including the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, and recently the Mississaugas of the Credit. And as a newcomer and a settler, I have been invited to lift the one spoon with all others who live here and who care for this land within the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Treaty. And my commitment to that is respectful collaboration and representation here on this podcast. And just as I have been invited to lift the spoon, I invite others now to lift that spoon as well and to peaceably weave with me a new world of possibility in wellness and in healthcare. And for me, that looks like decolonizing my language, um, my career, and the ways in which that I think and, and the people who I interact with think about medicine, about mindfulness, about spirituality, and about healing. And of course, that also means using my voice on this amazing platform for change and for breaking cycles. Podcasts, as you know, have so, so much potential for healing. And even hosting this has been great for my own soul-centered human transformation. Our guest tonight, Theodore, has our, their own incredible podcast and an incredible business vision, which we will get into. And before I introduce Theodore, I just wanted to um, welcome the folks who just joined. Uh, drop a little wave in the comments. Uh, you know, let us know where you're tuning in from. And for those of you watching this replay on our YouTube channel, Reawaken Co. Inspiring Insights, or those of you listening to this replay on our Spotify or other uh, platform platforms for podcasts, we welcome you. And thank you for showing up today. So my lovely guest, without further ado, is Theodore Kostasis today. Their Austronesian name is Ambon, and we're going to talk more about that in a second. I want to ask you about that, Theodore. <laughs> um, so Theodore decided to commit their life mission and vision in freeing beautiful warriors from trauma so that they can live the life that they deserve. After experiencing their own childhood sexual traumas and realizing that it is the fundamental root cause of their spiritual anguish, Theodore started working on their own traumas and intergenerational traumas for over 16 years, seeking healers and seekers alike around the globe. Then Theodore developed a simple and effective three-step method that can be employed in just six months time, which is called trauma processing. And we're gonna definitely dive into that in a bit. Theodore is a certified trauma integrated practitioner, a registered nurse with 10 years of experience in the mental health field, a naturopathic medical graduate, a Reiki practitioner, and a Qigong and yoga instructor. Together, Theodore combines these techniques in their groundbreaking and radical way of working with trauma. And we're gonna also do a little recentering practice, uh, a Qigong practice after, so stay tuned for that. Theodore believes that when we open our hearts, we open the gates to our highest possibilities. I love that. And they are also the host of Midnight Meditations podcast. Check it out. It's for free on all podcast platforms. And Theodore also runs a trauma consulting company where they run online courses, one-on-one uh, -on -one coaching and retreats. And to find out more, you can actually visit their website at sekmet.ca, which is S-E-K 
hmet.ca. Welcome, Theodore. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much, Erin. Like such a lovely, lovely introduction. And I totally wholeheartedly am in line with the work that you do and the respect that you give and just for your beautiful soul. <laughs> mm, thank you so much. And we were just saying actually before the recording, it's been a one full year. Uh, I was actually a guest on Theodore's podcast, The Midnight Meditations. Definitely go check that out. Uh, what an amazing thing you're running over at Midnight Meditations on that podcast. And I love it. I, I scoop up every episode of that. <laughs> <laughs> so glad to do. Um, yeah, like I remember reading your book on Victoria Day last year and Victoria Day for um, people outside of Canada. It's um, a celebration we have here where we have a lot of fireworks. So I remember <laughs> like binge reading Aaron's book and it was just fireworks all throughout. And that's how I remember. It's exactly a year from now that we last, um, that you were first on my show. You were one of my first guests and uh, one of the reasons why the podcast was so successful. Mm, thank you. I'm happy to hear that. <laughs> oh, your journey has been so, so vast. And, you know, just from meeting you at naturopathic school, I knew that we had some sort of, you know, divine connection. And, and I want to get into that more, Theodore, if we could tell us a little bit more about your journey, you know, first starting as a, as a nurse in mental health and then going into naturopathic medicine and then the more spiritual Reiki, uh, Qigong and yoga realms. Yeah, when you say like, tell me about your journey, I mean, I don't know when to begin, like how many <laughs> lifetimes? <laughs> so it started in ancient Egypt. <laughs> we can start there, that's, that's great. Um, but I guess, I suppose, yeah, my journey really began when, okay, so my um, ethnicity, <clears throat> First of all, I love the fact that people could interact here. So there is a dev from Nota Wasaga, I believe. And I just wanted to welcome you. Thank you so much for saying hello. And for anyone else out there that's listening, I think this is such a great platform that you provide, Erin, that everyone has the opportunity to participate and ask questions if they want. They're totally welcome to. So um, yeah, going back to my journey, thank you so much again for like letting me even talk about my journey. It's my first time being interviewed <laughs> oh my goodness I, I always interview I've interviewed so many people <laughs> it's your turn now it's on the other side of the table which is strange so um I suppose my journey um if we have to put a time frame to it began when I was around 13 or 14 years old I remember there's this um kind of like a secret society that I joined in high school <laughs> and I went to a Catholic school. I think just like you, you went to a uh, Catholic school, right? And um, there in the chapel, they, we had used this as a makeshift meditation room. So some, I had no idea what meditation was. I came to Canada when I was 11 from the Philippines. And that's where I'll talk about my Austronesian name later on. So, um, so I had no idea because I, I grew up in a Christian um, community. So I didn't know what meditation was. And somebody said, you know what? Um, she became a friend of mine. She was in grade 12. I was in grade nine. She's like, there's this group that meets every Friday. Like we talk about spiritual things and we meditate. Do you want to come? And I was like, okay, that sounds cool. Um, I was very introverted. So just the fact that a grade 12 asked me, like, you know, <laughs> I was, you know, like new to this school. I, you know, there's language and cultural barriers. Didn't have a lot of friends. So I was like, okay, I'll come. And so I was the youngest person of the group. A lot of them were all in grade 12. And I had my first meditation session. So I remember very clearly sitting in front of that, you know, the stained glass windows and the sun would be setting over it. It's west facing. And um, I sat down and I closed my eyes. And then for the first time in my life, I felt at home. And that's how it started. That's how my spiritual journey started. I said, this is amazing. And it's funny because for me, a lot of people say like, it's so hard to meditate. Um, like they all, almost a lot of, almost certainly like everyone that I met had entered meditation through some form of a physical practice like yoga or some sort of exercise where they can zone in and then be in that moment. 
for me, it was the opposite. My route, was, <laughs> I started with meditation and then I started figuring out, oh yeah, there is yoga and there is Qigong and there is all these other cool stuff. And that's how I ended up and finally ending in naturopathic medical school where you met me. But then as I, you know, as I started going into the healing arts, first with nursing and then with naturopathic medicine. So when I was a kid um, back in the Philippines, we would always play this game. It's kind of like a pretend game where we had all superpowers. I don't know if you've ever played that game, Erin, but... <laughs> oh yeah, of course. Superpowers. I play that game every day. What was your superpower? <laughs> <laughs> flying, flying. Amazing, amazing. Mm. And yeah, with your with your reach, with your presence online, you are literally flying around the world in every, like seconds. Oh, you boost me up. Boost me. <laughs> so, so for me, like my power was like I didn't like the whole confrontation. Like you know how Power Rangers were really a thing at the time, so everybody wanted to be the Red Ranger, right? Because the Red Ranger is you know the alpha. I was just like, you know, I don't want to be a part of all this fighting stuff. You know, I'm just going to stay in the background. And um, my power would be to be able to heal like the superheroes that were injured. So that way I don't have to be in the front lines. You know, <laughs> they Amazing. can um, see me and then they can fight another day. Throughout making uh, my own healing journey with my own sexual trauma, my childhood sexual trauma. And that's one of the reasons why I first entered a healing profession, because when you have such a traumatic experience to begin with you be, a lot of people become empaths and mm -hmm. empaths are naturally good at being healers because they're good at listening they're very sensitive they they're aware of others and their energies and how that um the dynamics happen which is why i guess meditation made so much sense for me because for the first time in my life i could just center in and focus on myself instead of pleasing everybody else. So I had gone into nursing school when I, after high school, thinking that, you know, I'm going to subconsciously fulfill my super power, which is the ability to heal others. And it wasn't until years later and several breakdowns and crises that I came to realize that such a power does not exist. <laughs> Oh. I do not have that ability and nor is that something that I want to have anymore because what I had realized is that the healing happens within and it goes back to that first time meditating. I'm responsible for my own healing journey, no one else. Yes, I could seek for advice and I could seek for counsel and help and assistance but nobody can lift me out of the dark hole and the mess that I'm in. Um, and that's kind of one of the most revolutionary things about the program that I created is that we don't use victim language. Uh, and that's why I, I call myself and everyone else who work with me as warriors, because being a warrior, you take that ownership and responsibility for yourself. And that's one of the first steps to healing is Acknowledging that, yes, um, something awful happened and it was done by another party that um, you had no responsibility over. And the first step is the acknowledgement of that and then taking responsibility. And, and that's really um, the beginning of reconciliation, because if we're stuck to that, you know, I was the one that was victimized. Uh, then we get stuck. I mean, there's a certain period of time where that's necessary, of course. And um, it was again in Buddhism that I found that, you know, the, the Buddha had said that, um, what did he say? I forgot now. <laughs> um, that, oh, geez, I hate it when this happens to me. Um, I'll come back to it later. Yeah, no worries. I'll come back to it later. Oh. <laughs> anyway but i'm yeah. so intrigued yeah i'm so intrigued just uh -huh. in that in that in that you know being able to res be responsible for you know you're not responsible for what happened mm -hmm. but you're responsible for moving forward from this point on for yourself yeah and that's how that power that's how you claim your superpower that mm -hmm. superpower to heal oh my gosh it's in all of us and discovering that is 
truly empowering and that's what I teach to everyone and um yeah it took me a long time but not that I've I'm on the other side, certainly not like that. It's a continuous work that's lifelong, but I'm in a place where I feel confident, where I can say that, yes, I am happy to help people who are in the same path. Mm. Thank you so much, Theodore, for, for bringing that into light too. I think victimhood, you know, even in terms of trauma, it's oftentimes uh, from the practitioner's perspective, yes, I'm trauma informed, but how can we move out of that language, you know, into more uh, resilience kind of oriented language so that it, it, it doesn't keep the people that we're working with in that kind of victimhood, right? And yeah, I'm seeing a, a comment here from one of the guests. Yeah. yeah, as a practitioner, spiritual guide myself, always remind others that, yeah, you're just the tool offering you know you're just the guy that's offering tools yeah I, I fully agree with that thank you for sharing that dev truly i i love this yeah i love that so much power to confront my sexual trauma head on mm -hmm. it's yeah it's it's divine timing for sure that you know that we come into that and like i said too there is a place where you kind of have to be in that moment of and I say moment in terms of <laughs> it's kind of maybe it's a phase, maybe it's a decade, maybe it's mm -hmm. you know for some time for some people it might be a good portion of their whole life. Um, this period of you know kind of victimhood or whatever, and just and just coming into terms and acknowledging that is is huge in itself. Absolutely, absolutely. By no means is it an easy feat. Or is it something that you just do overnight or you just think it through? Um, it's a whole transfiguration process. <laughs> yes. And this is the question I think that you wanted to ask me is like, what is the difference between a transformation I... and transfiguration? And just to cut through it. Oh my God, please. Yeah, please. <laughs> Let's talk about that. I'm really a big fan of um, because sometimes we use a word so many times that it loses meaning. And that's why, you know, my approach, I really try to be revolutionary when it comes to like radical, you know, transfiguration. It's actually a word I think that was used in the Bible um, uh, to describe the, the process that Jesus um, themselves went through, which is a complete um, transformation of every molecule into your body into something mm -hmm. something higher so so it's just it has so much weight when you say you know like it's like an alchemy of turning something um that is heavy and not very useful into something that is you know precious so it's an internal alchemy that happens. And that's why I was so drawn into the whole Qigong because Qigong itself is an internal alchemy. And uh, it's uh, both Qigong and yoga are very much unashamed and unapologetic about the sexuality that is, uh, that is a part of the practice. <laughs> and uh, we can also talk about that um, uh, later as well when we mm. do the Qigong exercise um yeah so yeah. you mentioned something just there too is is this sense of you know uh and and i feel and you spoke about this like you know growing up in a catholic environment you know the the whole sort of uh suppression and shame around our sexuality in general and i think you know it took me at least 30 years to come out of that um and, and I mean, I'm probably still in it, who knows, but, you know, I'm acknowledging, like you said, <laughs> and, and how can we, as, as other folks, you know, who have a lot of shame around um, sexual acts or, you know, just exploring their own kind of sexuality and maybe even gender at this point, you know, at this point in the world uh, of folks coming out as trans and non-binary and how can, can we start that process of transfiguration? Yeah, that's an amazing question. You know, I think, first of all, everyone's process is going to be unique to them. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why, although my approach is a three-step process, it's still very individualized. You know, it just 
it has a, a guiding platform so that we're not, you know, one day talking about coffee and then the other day talking about the weather. <laughs> we need a step-by-step -step tool that we can kind of gauge and, and check in and measure our progress and stuff. But ultimately, each and every individual has to start with that going in, that opening the door of their heart to examine what's in there. Cause it's easier. It's so much easier to look out to Aaron, right? Look at other people's problems and mm -hmm. gossip and complain. And um, there's just so many things that you could just <laughs> distract yourself out there. And in this world, you know, with social media, it's so easy. It's so easy to get sucked into that. And it's harder and harder and harder to have that moment when I was 13 or 14 in that chapel and that door opened for me and says, wow, I'm home. Like, I'm home and all this nastiness in here, like it's dark and there's cobwebs and there's skeletons, just as much as there, there's precious stones and valuable things and memories and people in here. It's important for us to start with ourselves uh, and to sit because that's the only way, that's the only way we're gonna, we're gonna grow. And it's really uncomfortable. And that's why people like you and I are here, Aaron, to make that journey a little bit more bearable so that you feel supported. But ultimately, again, it's going back to your responsibility. You can go a whole lifetime ignoring it. But that's the thing. It's just gonna keep knocking on your door. You could keep shutting the door. It's gonna keep knocking. And you know, one and every time it knocks, it just gets louder and louder and louder. And then eventually it's gonna be trying to like bash in there. And uh, you know, whether you're ready or not. And that's the thing with life is that it often comes knocking on your door at the least expected time. Certainly that's what we, that's why I got caught off guard. That's why it was a crisis. I mean, if I knew it was coming, it wouldn't have happened. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, you can say that again. I feel like that's like the main crux of all of it, you know, of all, learning in general. Like it's like we seek and we, you know, as you said, we might get called to the healing arts. We might become a yoga instructor. We might become a Reiki practitioner. We might get three or four degrees. And then all of a sudden, one day, maybe between it all or after it all or before it all, something hits. And I have this theory as well that it, it knocks a little bit and we might open the door a peek and then be like, whoa, and shut that door, you know, and then move on a bit. And then again, it, we hear that rapping, right? That gentle rapping. And so we open it maybe a smidge more at one point or another. And we look in and we say, okay, I know that that's there. I got to deal with that, but like, it's not the good, you know, it's not the right time kind of thing. And then we close it again. If we, if we have that privilege, you know, to close that. And then sometimes when you open, it's like, oh, I just lost the doorknob <laughs> and the door remains open. Absolutely. And so, Yes, absolutely. You're absolutely right. I totally agree with you, which is why, you know, in the process that I've created, we learn to befriend the, what is the uninvited guest mm -hmm. um, that knocks in the most inconvenient time, you know, when you're trying to have a decent conversation with your partner, and then it's a trigger. This is one of the things that I, it's really controversial, but I'm out there like, you know, uh, triggers, a lot of therapists are afraid of the T word. They dare not go near it. But I always say that, you know, the thing that you seek the most is behind fear and behind that trigger. I, don't, I didn't say that. Somebody else did. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember who, so I can't give them credit. But yeah, the thing that we want the most is, is behind fear. So oftentimes triggers are a way of that kind of shadow knocking into our door, trying to communicate something. So one of the ways that we begin with is maybe sending an invitation card to like slipping a, would you like to come over for tea at four o'clock, you know, this afternoon? Because I have that space and time for you. That's not when I'm sitting in the board meetings. That's not when I'm trying to have a conversation with my spouse or my child. Um, sending this invitation is, is a way to to manage like when are we gonna you know have a face-to-face -face, you know and, and nowadays a face-to-face -face is really difficult because everything is 
face the screen. <laughs> so, yeah. but but yeah, so you you invite this this guest, uninvited guest in, and uh, one of the things I think this is really in Buddhism now for sure is that you create a space in your home, a guest space for the uninvited guest. So that way it doesn't muck around the other, you know, kitchen and things like that. And in that moment is when you have. Um, in Buddhism, it's like cultivating loving kindness for and complete compassion and equanimity, which is a, a term to describe um, um, absolute, uh, um, I, I don't know how to describe equanimity. Um, maybe Aaron, you have a word for it to describe it. It's like a, a complete um, acceptance almost without being affected of what is in front of you and to be the ability to see things objectively and to discern i think mm -hmm. that's what, the best way i could describe it and and see and listen and open our ears and our heart and our eyes to what it has to say because that thing knocking on your door that trigger that trauma it has something valuable for us to say like everything you know all the dark sides and the light sides and the aspects of ourselves has something to contribute so that we become this we become like in the process of transfiguration without those key ingredients like you can't play the piano by just playing you know the light keys you also have to press on the dark keys or vice versa mm. it doesn't matter so i wanted to share with you a story about um recently i you know just because you know you're working with trauma so you're constantly forced to examine your own healing and that's why i said from the beginning like i don't think there is an other side because it's gonna be a lifelong maybe several lives long and recently you know like i i started working on my intergenerational trauma mm -hmm. and that was um mind-blowing <laughs> because i was like just when i thought i had like unearthed everything <laughs> i was like okay um there are way more and um and so i embarked on that task and i realized um how important it is uh this year on march 2021 um is the 500 year anniversary where um the philippines was the was colonized by Spain. And mm. so coming into coming towards March, I was already beginning to feel, I don't know, like my insides were screaming with like, I was almost reliving this intergenerational trauma that happened five or six, maybe seven generations ago, 500 years ago, right? Yeah. And um, my grandfather lived up to a hundred. He actually just passed away last year. So I was like five of him, like that's when these things started happening. And that's why I found it was crucial for me to have an Austronesian name. So Austronesia describes the ethnic groups of people that lived on islands from Taiwan to the Philippines and Malaysia, Indonesia, all the way to Madagascar and Micronesia and Polynesia, Hawaii, <clears throat> okay. the island. Um, New Zealand and Tahiti. So a lot of us have um, tattoos. So this tattoo was given to me by a 103 year old um, elder lady who lived in the mountains and she tattooed it using charcoal. And funny enough, like she tattooed mountains here, like which kind of look like exploding volcanoes. But the next day I received the tattoo, um, a volcano erupted. So I, and on a full moon. So it was, oh, it was very, yeah. It was very, um, it was very um, auspicious mm -hmm. uh, and very special for me too, because I remember also having a near death experience um, on that trip where I, I was, I was taken by a riptide. I love to surf and uh, I was surfing and I was taken by a riptide into the middle of the ocean and uh, I thought I wasn't going to make it. And, um, and I just had a conversation with mother ocean and I said, you know, it is what it is. <laughs> it's not like I could do anything. Um, if I lose my board, certainly I would die because the waves were so tall. They are about eight feet tall, maybe. Um, and I just remember looking to the shore and like the buildings were tiny. <laughs> it was like, there's no boat that could come and get me because the waves were so big. 
I was just like, okay, so I mean, there's only two things that could happen here. It's either I'm going to die or I'm going to survive somehow miraculously. <laughs> and uh, I wasn't new to near death. My first one was I was, you know, a toddler and I was bit by a rabid dog. And um, if you look at the statistics of the people that survive rabies, it's nearly zero <laughs> so, wow. so somehow I miraculously made it through and obviously I made it through that ordeal because I'm speaking to you but something happens when you go through a when when you come face to face with death you know that's another thing that knocks into our doors that we don't like to answer yes and I, I, I know your story um, when your dad um, um, died um, was that was something that was really meaningful to you and that's when you had that face to face with death mm -hmm. and um i have to say it um death is the equalizer it you know having a cup of tea with death is a, a marvelous thing to happen i mean it's it's a scary thing uh, just like a lot of things but it really gives you a different perspective of life That's the oh other my goodness of thank you theodore for just expressing all of that and <laughs> And like, yeah, survivorship and whatever that means to folks, you know, I, I think there's a lot of similarities in the way that we, yeah, approach death and also approach these doors, you know, that we we don't know, this, this kind of mysterious thing that kind of uh, emits, you know, it, it really touches our fear point big time as we go through our lives. And yeah, there's something about folks who have touched that you know, have, have, as you said, kind of had tea <laughs> with that is there's a sense of humility and this like extraordinary sensation about these folks, you know, and uh, yeah, there's, there is, as I said before, like this divine thing that you feel, that you literally feel with folks when you, when you meet them. I am so, so curious about about your work and thank you for explaining a little bit more about your your you know your whole process that you do with clients and i wanted before we get into the qigong practice just to touch a little bit because i was looking at your website and you know you have some testimonials there and a lot of folks talk about this kind of purging this releasing and for everybody out there we're recording this on the day of a full moon um we're so apt so apt right so i just wanted to touch on this importance of you know kind of crying and releasing and purging and not really hovering at the outside of that not hovering at the periphery but going right into the roots of the trauma and really just get in there and purge it somehow can we talk about that a little bit how does it come up for you maybe how does it come up for for folks that you work with well i'm i I've self-doubted, self-dubbed, <laughs> sorry, English is my second language. <laughs> I've self-dubbed, self-appointed myself the, the, the queen of uh, purging next to Marie Kondo, because I don't think anyone can outdo her. She's the queen. <laughs> I come second. And I actually, uh, you know, I just finished school. Like it's been a long 14 year journey um, to get to here. And I think there's still more to come, who knows? But I started purging. <laughs> I, I employed Marie Kondo's, I think, five-step method. I really mm -hmm. like it. I love it. It was hard. Uh, it was emotional. I was, she made me throw away things I didn't want to. <laughs> yes, we get <laughs> emotionally <laughs> attached. How oh, dare you? <laughs> <laughs> so, but I'm like, no, release it. Because, you know, when I release this, then there's new room. There's, it's kind of like an old tree that has fallen, right? It, it's important to mourn its loss, but then look at all the space it's created and with this death, a new life could come out, you know? Mm. So that is kind of a symbolic, you know, that physical purging and letting go of things and being, the most important thing is like being grateful for it, you know? Thank you for being a part of my life and for serving your purpose. And I'm now relinquishing you so that you can be, appreciated by someone else or you can do your other duties to someone else um that physical journey for me has been um a symbolic of the you know the purging is definitely necessary um as a part of 
healing trauma. Like I, I just don't see it happening without that purge. It's, um, it's, there's a lot of things, you know, <laughs> needs to be let go of. I mean, that's, that's an essential ingredient, which is why, um, every summer and winter solstice, except this year, I'm not doing the summer solstice one, but I have, will be doing a winter solstice burning ceremony because it is a symbolic surrendering and letting go and creating an offering to the element of fire to take care of those things that are no longer serving us. So the purging is essential. Um, and I really, really say that with, um, with like every element in my body because holding on to, to things, and, and oftentimes it's not like we wanna hold on to things, it's just, this is what's become normal and familiar. So letting go of what's familiar can be a really, really scary thing. So there's a lot of fear and there's an emotion. That's why, you know, things like this could take long periods of time. And, um, you know, there's many different ways to do it. You know, I, I used to go to sweat lodges and that's, you know, like a purge, you know, a, a really strong purge. Homeopathy does that too, you know, spiritual practices, you know, Reiki, like there's so many, you have to pick what is your, your medicine, what mm -hmm. works for you. And um, that, that purge is, is essential. Like it, it just is, sorry, what, what was the question? The importance. Oh, you it's answered important. it, honey. Yeah, you, you're good. I feel like, that, oh my goodness. Yeah, you touched on everything that I was even going to mention about, you know, this whole aspect of just letting go, you know, and of course, that's one of the acceptance and also letting go two pillars of the mindfulness practice that I teach in my own course. And I always say this, that our, our bodies are a lot older than our brains right? Mm -hmm. This like kind of deductive reasoning. We've only developed that frontal part of our brain, like, like really recently in, you know, the history of the entirety of Homo sapiens. And so our bodies have this innate wisdom and memory that we don't even recognize in our intelligence, right? In our intel intellect. And so, yeah, Deb, when you say that, release the stored trauma from our physical body. Our body holds things that we don't even know, that we can't rationalize, right? So accepting that is part of that and then letting go and doing that purge, that release. I, I love what you said there. Mm. Yeah, which goes back to actually to the story of like the, the decolonialism. Cano ah, cannoli. I like cannolis. <laughs> cannoli. <laughs> <laughs> colonialization <laughs> sorry here goes my english <laughs> you nailed it you nailed it okay um i needed to reconnect with my roots because there were so many things that were just out of whack i was like i thought these words were filipino words but they are spanish words <laughs> and i was like what like my last name was spanish like what what was i called before <laughs> you know 500 years ago and it was just yeah so owning like you know i relearned a language so the philippines which is really controversial which i don't really like to even call it that because <clears throat> It was never called the Philippines mm -hmm. before Spain arrived. It was then called, it was named after a king in Spain. And so I, I tend to call it Austronesia, which encompasses the entire islands that we all lived in. We lived with Mother Ocean, the Pacific Ocean, who spared my life is my mother. You know, it fed us for generations and we somehow sailed the seas in tiny canoes using the birds and the night sky to get from, you know, Mm. imagine how far Hawaii is from Tahiti like that's how people got to Hawaii like in tiny canoes <laughs> wow <laughs> it's far like Madagascar is like all the way in Africa right <laughs> so somehow you're right there's this intelligence that we know nothing about but somehow it's it's part of our DNA and that's what do you call that the um uh these terms <laughs> it, it just gets interwoven and that's why it becomes you know transfiguring intergenerational trauma into multi-generational strengths like how do we do that so for me it meant learning the culture and the languages and being involved so there were written languages that were lost um i lost i, I don't have it here but um 
I started learning, you know, languages. So there's in the Philippines alone, there's about 175 still spoken language um, that are um, like the original <laughs> languages in those islands. And because there are different groups of islands, different cultures develop. So for me, it was really reconnecting with what that, you know, what that means. Um, and and yes, accepting that what has happened has happened. And I can, you know, I can't, you know, there's a, there's a period of time where certainly I was very angry and I felt um, helpless and, and you go through a my rate of emotions. Um, and it wasn't until, um, you know, a long time of, you know, being helped with professionals, uh, for me, homeopathy really did it. I was prescribed a remedy because I was so angry. <laughs> I, I was so angry, I wanted to annihilate the whole human race. <laughs> it, was, it was really bad. <laughs> and uh, I was prescribed a homeopathic remedy. And honestly, it, um, it, it, um, it truly created like this amazing, I, I can't describe it. Wow. Um, and, the, and the remedy was actually a... Um, a volcano, which to me was um, really significant because my mother was, you know, grew up under a volcano. Um, <laughs> we, we lived by the ring of fire, so it was very volcanic. And that explained my anger. It, if I have to, an anger, I found like anger was a word that was just did not describe what I was going through. And because, you know, I, I practice Buddhism and I'm attending my weekly Buddhist courses and they're like, yeah, anger is one of the three poisons. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm a bad Buddhist angry all the time and now you're telling me I can't even be angry so it was it was yeah it was like rage inside of me it was like a volcanic explosion about to happen and I was you know bursting with anger like to the people that didn't deserve that it's kind mm -hmm. of when a volcano erupts like whoever's the closest gets annihilated so um it's yeah. not choosing who so realizing the nature of my emotions um, and not just emotions but going really deep into the core of the intergenerational trauma and um acknowledging that oh yeah this you know this was messed up it happened and uh at the time people probably didn't know any better like now we still don't know any better <laughs> so we do things right now that i'm sure 500 years from now will be condemned um i'm talking about factory farming you know <laughs> yeah um, overfishing just yeah child labor things like that um <clears throat> definitely wrong things we know it's wrong it happens people turn a blind eye to it and i'm sure yeah so I need to focus on myself and what I can do to empower myself. And so I started honoring and respecting the traditions, the languages, the culture, and going back and learning because learning brings life back to those things that have already been forgotten. And when I look at it and I look at the, the culture, um, you know, where I grew up in, I was like, no, we actually carried our culture through our DNA. Like it changed, it adapted through what it needed to, to be resilient. But at the very core, you know, our beliefs and our values about community and, you know, what's important to us, although our religion changed, but our spirituality is still there. It's very much intact, you know, like the volcano is still active. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, that's... Oh, wow. Thank you, Theodore, again. you're. I just let you speak because, like, everything coming out of your mouth is like, whoa, 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 whoa. I love that so much. And I just want to repeat one phrase that you had said because it's it's brilliant. It's really brilliant. Configuring intergenerational trauma to multi-generational strength. Mm-hmm. Mm, that that just speaks to that piece on that alchemy, really, that really amazing kind of transfiguration. Oh, so, so gorgeous. Thank you for, for wording that in such a way. Um, and I find that there is a pattern of, you know, I, I think a lot of us, at least this year, if not before, have been really shown that we need to connect back with our roots, connect back with our 
our generations upon generations. And even, you know, for me, that's been learning a little bit of Gaelic and reading a lot of archives and studying Druid medicine and all of that. And that, it, it makes me grounded here in this moment. And that's uh, such a gift, such a gift to, to be able to do that. Yeah, like I heard you speaking Gaelic. I was like, wow, like that's fascinating, mm -hmm. you know, and there's so much history there, you know, in, in Ireland, like the Druids and, mm -hmm. oh, it's, you know, there's everybody, you know, where if we find, and, and that's the thing, it's not like you have to know, like, in order to know, because to truly know is like in the core. Yeah, it's like to truly embody, right? You don't need to know yeah. it up here. You don't need exactly that. Might help a little, but you know, yeah, you have to really embody that. And I, I love that experience. I love that so much. Um, I'm thinking about uh, your your gift as a qigong practitioner, and also thinking mm -hmm. about the folks who might be listening to this uh, via podcast who can't see. Uh, your okay. actions so um instruct accordingly <laughs> yeah as if you could that would be amazing and uh, uh -huh. thank you thank you so much for that offer absolutely oh yeah and you know before i i go there i i just wanted to finish off the story with my name <laughs> yes <laughs> so please i completely forgot you know um because yeah you're right like i wanted my ancestors to be proud and so i a, a name came to me and ambon um which means in in tagalog it means um summer rain kind of like a light refreshing rain mm -hmm. and uh, in indonesian it means beautiful and uh i just love that name <laughs> i was like that is a name that i can be proud to call myself and we don't we didn't have last names i don't think we did before the spanish arrived so mm -hmm. so that's what that name means ambon summer yeah. rain thank you <laughs> you so, are a summer rain <laughs> i love the rain i actually thrive in the rain and today it rained just beautiful. today yeah we've had thunder showers which i love i love thunder oh so okay let's do the qigong um so i always probably the best way to do this is standing up so without you know obscuring my microphone i'm gonna encourage everyone if you're listening unless you're driving don't do this <laughs> but if you if you are driving you can do it seated um but if you are um watching here let me make myself visible um we can do a qigong exercise that brings us into our body and start that transfiguration alchemy the first thing we do is we get connected with our roots which is our feet you know if we look at ourselves as a tree the rest of the from waste should be under the earth. These are our roots. So we become aware of our roots by lifting the ten toes up. And when you lift the ten toes up, then you can plant the big toe mound to the ground, the little toe mound to the ground, the inner heel, and then the outer heel. And then as you take a deep breath in, and if you're able to safely, I invite you to close your eyes and see if you could bring your awareness. <clears throat> from your feet grasping the, the earth underneath of you feeling fully supported and see if just like the roots of the tree you can begin to draw precious energy from the earth and allow it to begin to travel up your ankles your 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 shins your calves your knees and see if you can give your knees a micro bend so that you know they, they don't put so much stress on themselves and then from there, I invite you to take another breath and then draw that energy up the thighs, the inner outer thighs to the hips and see if you can align your pelvis so that as if it's a bowl of water so that it's not spilling over forward or spilling over backwards. So it's just in equanimity, in perfect balance. And from here, we're going to activate our Mula Bandha, which is this, mm, this muscle between the the genitals and the perineum and we're just going to give that a, a squeeze it's called a secret squeeze in, in tantra and then we're gonna just activate that a little bit so we know so every time we inhale we activate it and exhale release so inhale breathing in the energy from the earth up to the base of the foot upwards to the perineum 
and then bringing your energy right here to the belly button. This is the, one of the one of the burners, the dantian, the lower dantian. So we're just gonna give the the lower belly, the belly button area, uh, a nice rub. You know, you can go clockwise or counterclockwise, whichever makes sense to you. And as we draw more energy, we're gonna fill our entire lungs and open our heart, open our chest and allow our shoulders to relax downwards. Allow our spine to lengthen upwards to reach the light, allowing our crown to grow tall so that we are standing or sit sitting in a dignified position, okay? From here, we're going to introduce um, more awareness to our breath. So as we breathe in, I'm gonna take a full breath of air. And as we exhale, let it out through the nose. So inhale through the nose, exhale out through the nose. So we're gonna give it some more energy. So inhale, we're gonna send the breath to the belly, inflating it like a balloon. So it helps you to have your hand over the belly button. You can inhale, expand, exhale, squeeze the perineum out. Inhale, out. So every time you inhale, you are expanding your belly fully. And every time you exhale, you're drawing the energy from the earth up, squeezing your perineum. So inhaling, exhaling, inhaling, exhaling. And if you're standing, you're almost bending your knees as you inhale to allow expansion into the belly. So this is called barrel breathing in Qigong. So we're just gonna do some barrel breathing. Um, typically 18 times is the minimum, 1832 um, is where you, where you wanna aim. So let's do that 18 times on your own. So. Good, so that's 18 times. And then you do this another 18 times and then another 18 times on your own time. And then from here, we're just gonna wake up our Jing, our kidney chi. So we're going to start twisting our waist and then we're gonna allow our arms to, to twist. We're gonna, allow, we're gonna allow our arms to land in our flanks, the back where our kidneys where are located. So we're just gonna gently tap that just to wake up our, the Jing is actually the, the energy, the life source that connects us to all of our ancestors. It's the original source of Qi. So it's all stored there in the kidneys. So we're just gonna do some twisting and then we're gonna wake up the, what is called the meridians or the energy channels along the body by giving it a tap starting from the, um, the arms, the inner aspect, the hands, the outer aspect, and then the outer aspect, and then inner chest, belly, inner thighs, and then outer legs, calves, back, and then just shake it out. It's always good to shake things out. This is always a part of my um, sessions, is just shaking things out. Sometimes things that stick to you, you just wanna shake it off, dust it off, just get rid of it. Make any sound that makes sense. So allow your voice box, your your um, your throat chakra to be involved. So for me, it's just like, oh. So I'm bouncing up and down on my heels and just letting out a, oh. Shaking side, side, oh. oh. Good. How is that feeling for everyone out there? So now that we're all shaken out, everything else that doesn't need to stick has been removed, hence the purging that Aaron talked about. We're gonna begin to start inviting beneficial energy into our life because throughout the day we accumulate um, negative energy. So it's important to release it in such a way. And now we're going to invite energy in. So with our dignified stand, feet, um, shoulder distance apart, micro band, hips, um, pelvis is in a neutral position, standing tall and dignified. We're going to begin tapping into our third eye with one finger. 
you know, or fingers, whatever, whatever makes sense. Or all fingers can do whatever you want. <laughs> There's no rules. <laughs> um, so with your eyes closed, if you can, begin to tap in into your third eye. Remember to be always be aware of the perineum, the lower dantian, which is just under the umbilicus here, and the breath. So we're going to breathe in. And as we're breathing in here and tapping into this third eye, we're going to imagine this big ball of sunshine rising from the eastern horizon. We're going to extend our arms to welcome it. And the sun is smiling onto you. This is called the smiling sunshine meditation. So this smiling sunshine is bracing you with all the love, compassion, and joy that you deserve in your life. But sometimes the door is closed. So we're going to open the door right here into our third eye and we're going to receive as we inhale allow this brilliance to enter the third eye so the smiling sunshine you're going to receive it and it feels so good that you want to smile like all the worries from your face just begins to melt away and it's going to go and descend and light up the darkest places in your heart you can rub in this light sometimes you can actually feel the warmth you're going to rub in that light, that smiling sunshine, and you're going to transfigure any kind of sadness and sorrow that may be here in the, the lungs is what holds those in the chest area. And then you're going to move the light into this upper left quadrant of your abdomen, which is where the spleen organ is found. So any overthinking worrying, we're going to transform that and transfigure that into positive, smiling energy, just pure radiance. And then we're going to bring it down to the bladder area and maybe even to the kidneys area and whatever fear or trauma that may have happened to you in your life. You're going to just bring that smiling sunshine there and encourage whatever fear or trauma that you may have experienced to to be released, to be like yoga. So we're gonna rub that smiling sunshine in there. And the next organ is the liver. And we're gonna rub it there. And anger you might have felt because of what has happened that was out of your control or somebody else did that was unfair or anger towards yourself. We're going to transform that energy, that anger energy into love and compassion and kindness. And we're gonna bring it back to the heart. This is the heart fire. Breathe that smiling sunshine in, right into the lower dantian. Remember your connection to the earth. Let the earth feed you with good positive energy and let the earth take the negativity the sadness, the grief, the anger, the trauma, the worry. Because our waste products are actually food for Mother Nature. And then whenever you would like, you can slowly come back into the present moment. I invite you to slowly open your eyes, maybe a little bit opening the eyelids and then halfway and then all the way. So that is a simple but effective a uh, qigong exercise that i use and and my working with my clients i hope you all enjoyed it and i encourage you to practice it every day because every day you know things latch onto us whether we like it or not and it's important just like we bathe we clean you know that we also perform that spiritual cleaning of ourselves every single day and that's why it's called a practice. <laughs> oh my goodness, Theodore. Thank you. Yes, that was so incredible. Anyone out there right now listening, if you want to pause the video and just go ahead and journal or do what you need to do, just feel into that space a little bit more. I know I'm feeling very centered. So thank you again, Theodore. That was a beautiful, beautiful gift. Well, thank you, Erin. Mm. Thank you for having this space for me to be able to share. Um, again, I'm just here, um, just like an average person out there, 
doing whatever my heart makes it sing. <laughs> yeah, and you know, some people could read those notes, other people might be singing that same song. You don't always have to understand the music to 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 jive with it, you know, and I, and I really really appreciate that that divinity that you have and you hold within yourself. And it's clear that you know, you do this these practices every day. <laughs> Yeah, and thank, thank you, you so much for all the people participating. Um, thank you so much for participating and for all the amazing comments. I I'm so looking forward to you know seeing your faces. <laughs> I hope one day. <laughs> oh my goodness, yes, yeah. Thank you again so much. Um, I do have one more question for you, and you know you can just kind of spitfire this real quick. And it's something that I ask all of my guests here on Inspiring Insights. And that is for you, Theodore, what keeps you inspired? Oh, that's really a, a good question. You know, Erin, I have to admit that I'm oh, I'm not always inspired. You know, I'm not a person that just like, oh, yay, like, you know, SpongeBob, like, another <laughs> day. <laughs> um, there are days where I feel very uninspired. And I think those days are equally important for me to just take it easy and chill out and just allow myself to be in that state without trying to change it or, or anything. So, yeah, like, I don't know. I just try to live every day in the, as present-minded as I could, but it's really difficult. But in terms of a source of inspiration, a single source of inspiration, I don't know. I, I can't really answer that question. <laughs> that is one of the most unique answers I've gotten. <laughs> and thank you for that. And thank you for, for shining a light, you know, in that darkness and, and the importance of really sitting in that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I don't. Yeah. And it's, it also makes us all human, right? Because I, I can guarantee you, like, you know, the people out there that, you know, look like they're having a fabulous life like it's it's different behind the closed doors <laughs> yeah so you know it's important to acknowledge and just respect like where we need to be at the time and and that to me is enough inspiration to to continue on yes yes totally agreed i'm gonna take this space right now um to just open the floor up if there are questions um, you can either write it in the chat or come off mute. Let me look at the chat here. And uh, while you know, while we're receiving any comments or questions for you, Theodore, I just want to mention as well a very, very big thank you to Juniper Naturopathic Clinic in Fort McMurray, Alberta. They have provided us with some sponsorship funds to keep this going, to keep Inspiring Insights going. And uh, I'm happy to say that I will be allocating some of those funds toward each of the next couple episodes. And uh, Theodore will be receiving compensation for, for delivering their beautiful wisdom here tonight. So thank you, Juniper Naturopathic Clinic. Very, very much appreciated. Um, they're an amazing clinic. Uh, go ahead, check them out on Instagram. They're Juniper Naturopathic Clinic and um, very, very queer and very progressive and forward thinking. I love that. Thank you so much, Juniper Clinic. Are, are they in Calgary or Edmonton? Uh, Fort McMurray. Oh, Fort Mac, all the way up there. Okay, that's amazing. Thank you so much. You know, I hope to meet you one day. I do love Alberta. <laughs> Uh, so getting a little comment here, don't have any questions, but I really appreciated this beautiful conversation and look forward to following your work ongoing, which is incredible. And uh, maybe Theodore, you could actually speak to that in terms of how folks can get in contact with you. Yeah, thank you. And I think there's also a comment about stored trauma in the physical body. That is, um, I don't know if it was mentioned in the show, but that is exactly where I work with when it comes to trauma. It's it's very somatic and sensational. Um, it's not so much just thinking things through, which are helpful in, in certain um, aspects, but if you really want to get to the root of things, you have to go into the, into the you know, feeling, the, the um, som somatic sensations. And that's where the knowing comes from. It's just, you know, 
um, and in terms of getting a hold of me, I'm actually doing something revolutionary here, Erin. I am quitting um, Instagram. Ooh. And yeah, so that is not the place to find me. <laughs> Here's my Instagram handle, but don't go there. <laughs> Instead, um, so I'm going to take a little bit of a hiatus because I need to study for my boards um, this coming August. So that's why I'm canceling the summer solstice burning ceremony, but there will be a winter solstice. So stay tuned for that. And that one is free. And also every autumn, I run a course, um, a foundations to trauma processing course. So this is when we go through that seven step model. So that way when, when people, so that's the first step. And then the second step is the one-on-one -on -one, um, work with me. So by taking this course, they're actually equipping themselves with all of the tools they need so that when they show up, it becomes a very efficient 12, um, 12 session process where we dive right into the trauma because they've already equipped with themselves with all the tools that they need and the skills to, in order to do that. And so the, that course happens every autumn in October, every year. And then I take on people to the one-on-one. -on -one, and after that, I then hold retreats whenever we can then do that. So the best way to get a hold of me is to go to my website at sekhmet.ca, S-E-K-H-M-E-T dot CA because I'm based in Canada. And then right now my website has a quiz, which is gonna change very soon to just something that says subscribe to our newsletter. Essentially that quiz is going to take you to our newsletter subscription. And that is the primary way that I'm going to communicate with everyone out there because that actually goes to my personal email so you can reply to that automated newsletter if you have any questions um, if you'd like to meet with me just to chat whatever um, that subs the newsletter is the way to go because I promise never to spam anyone I send out one newsletter every month and then there I send you maybe pictures or whatever, videos, sometimes I sing <laughs> and updates on my podcast. So that's the way to get a hold of me. So sekhmet.ca, S-E-K-H-M-E-T dot C-A. And if anyone's wondering what that means, uh, Sekhmet is the ancient Egyptian warrior goddess of healing. And that's why um, I've chosen um, her. Hopefully she's okay with it. <laughs> 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 to 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 revive uh, an old ancient spiritual practice that is um, no longer practiced. Yeah. Wow. Thank you again so so much, Theodore Kastasis, everybody, Austronesian name, Ambon. Thank you again for being here. I really sincerely have really very much enjoyed this episode and just that recentering practice. I'm going to go back and do that again for sure. Be sure to check out Theodore's Midnight Meditations podcast as well. That's one way you can kind of get to know them a little bit more. And like I said before, if you are interested in uh, sponsoring an episode or if you know someone who owns a business who would like to donate some of their retail items, you know, cute earrings or like political statements, teas, whatever, um, please reach out to me. I'm on Instagram at the Aaron Edwards or reawakened underscore co. Uh, you can always email me as well at hello at reawakenco.com. This has been episode 37 of Inspiring Insights, everyone. Thank you so much for being here and for doing the things for yourselves. See you again next week.